afternoon, everybody. So when I step on a podium to talk about robotics these days, I get nightmares because by the time I get off the stadium, all the technology that I've talked about is already obsolete. <laughs> so that's the speed of the field in robotics these days. But let me start by asking you an uh, introspective, perhaps a rather personal question. Do you like to be in control all the time? Are you guys a little bit of a control freak? Personally, having studied and taught control theory for a living, I would say I'm a bit obsessed with this topic. You know, I even bought my own laptop. <laughs> if you ask my wife, she'll give you a completely different and maybe, maybe a more col colorful uh, story. <laughs> but what does this have to do with robotics and being OK tomorrow? Well, it turns out that robotics, the way it will be used in the near future, has to do with sharing control. So one of the most promising avenues for using robotics is through something called shared autonomy. So let me explain what that means. It involves sharing significant part of the control or devolving that to the machine with the human still in the loop. So let me start by giving you an example. So on the one hand, you have robots that are completely teleoperated. In other words, we capture the human making a particular kind of movement. You transfer it through either some sort of sensors on your body, through inertial sensors, through motion sensors, and then do a mapping onto getting a robot to mimic you. On the other extreme, you have researchers doing research in robotics to get robots to be fully autonomous, to be completely independent of human intervention. For example, a humanoid robot like this, you would ask the robot to open a door, but the robot has to figure out for itself what are the intermediate steps for it to walk, balance, do a, a grasping and manipulation task, and actually open the door. The robotics that we are going to see in the next five to 10 years is actually going to lie somewhere in between. So really, what we are trying to do in research is to push this slider all the way from teleoperation to more autonomous behavior. So the new kinds of robots that you're going to see in action tomorrow are already in action lie somewhere in the middle. And that's what I mean by shared autonomy. Okay? So if you take some examples of robots that are already in operation today, things like prosthetics and exoskeletons, things like self-driving cars. I'm not sure if you've heard about the new initiative in the UK about legislation to allow self-driving cars to be tested on UK roads. Things like underwater robotics, medical robotics, service robotics, industrial robotics, nuclear decommissioning robots. So all of these robots, and most of them are in operation today, they have a big problem to deal with full autonomy. And some of the challenges arise from the fact that these robots have to operate in an environment that you and me, in an unstructured environment, just like um, you and me operate on an everyday. So it's got to deal with close interactions, it's got ambiguity in sensing, it's got noise in the system. You need to guarantee certain levels of safety for human operation. So what I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes is to give you a glimpse of the kind of research that we are doing to try and alleviate some of these problems and move this more towards fully autonomous robotic platforms. OK, so let's start with the first thing. Robots, just like you and me, have to sense the world. And not just sense it in the raw sort of perception uh, in terms of regular sort of cameras and sort of cloud point sensors, but actually make sense of the world in terms of the percept. 
So what does that mean? It means going from some sort of raw sensors, like some depth cameras, LiDAR sensors, to actually representing the world around you. So there's been tremendous progress in making that happen. In the next video, you'll see an example of a humanoid robot, and this is a collaboration with MIT that we have here on the DARPA Robotics Challenge. It's about a humanoid robot trying to make its way through this pile of blocks. And it's getting some raw sensors, but while it's doing that, it is incrementally, in real time, trying to make sense of the world around it, trying to figure out what are the possible footsteps that it can do. It, can, it has to make a, a judgment about the terrain. It has to make a judgment about the stability of the ground and use this in an incremental, real-time fashion. So, as you can all notice, the, the view that the robot is getting is rather impoverished. But from that, it has to make sense of the world around it to achieve something like continuous walking. So, for example, it has to take this raw signal, break it down into point clouds, segments, and even footpaths through terrain segmentation. So that's the first step, okay? So that's great. Once we get there, the next step is to talk the same language. So it's not enough if the robots are able to perceive the world in its own coordinate frame. When we instruct robots with a particular goal, then we do it in a particular way. For example, if you want a robot to reach inside this box, then you typically don't say, go to position X, Y, and Z, but rather we say, reach into this box. But that needs to get translated into a program that really reaches into a position X, Y, and Z. So how can we achieve this sort of merge this gap between robot speak and human speak? And one way of doing that is by what we call context-aware representations. So by representing relations between objects and places. So an example of that is, in this case, we represent the fact that the robot needs to reach into this box by defining the relationship that the, the end effector should have with respect to the box. The advantage of that is when the box moves, the concept of what is inside and outside moves with it. So you can actually instruct robots to do things in a much more intuitive fashion, um, something that is reasonable for you and me to understand. So, so again, here is an example of doing collision avoidance by using this concept of relational, um, relational representations. Okay, so that was sensing and representation. The next big thing that humans have that we try to get robots to, to mimic or adapt is the ability to predict. And why is this important? It's important because you do not or you cannot actually account for all possible things that may happen in the world. You need to be able to predict the consequences of your action and generalize this concept from few examples. So let me start by giving you a, an interesting example. If you want to balance this pole, okay, I'm not very good at it, but if you now try to get a robot to do this task, you can program something to balance, to move the fingertips for a pole of length half a meter with a particular weight. If you change the weight of the top, on the top of the, the, the pole, or if I make the length of the pole bigger, then you probably have to write another program. But on the other hand, if you have a scenario where you can learn from examples, you can have a scenario where just like babies do what we call motor babbling, by moving its arms around, the robot is trying to figure out what is the consequence of applying a certain force to a particular joint, and what happens to the, to the actual fingertip. So once you know how to move your fingertip, then you can go on and do slightly more interesting learning behaviors, like, in this case, you can 
get the robot to try out pole balancing. It will not get it the first time, not get it the second time, but all the time, it's learning the consequence of its actions, and it's giving a value to the action that it's taking, and eventually, it figures out that the actions which keep the pole upright are these. So this is a way, this is, this is going away from the traditional way of programming robots, but getting it to learn and adapt so that next time I change something about the pole, it can relearn from this, from this original behavior. Okay? So this is something quite innate to us, quite hard to translate into robotic platforms. Okay, great. So we've got robots which can sense reasonably well, perhaps have some element of adaptation. Still, there is a lot of uncertainty in this world. So you still need some guarantees, some safeguards that robots are not going to go berserk, okay? It's not going to hurt the people. So the way to do that, or one of the ways to do that, is by what we call compliant actuation. In other words, in simple terms, it is like putting springs in the joints of the robot so that while it's doing something, while somebody comes in its way, it's not going to literally rip its arms off. Okay? Let me show you a quick video of that. This is a very powerful robot applying huge amounts of torques and forces, but I can push against it, and it will give in. So by combining this ability to be soft while achieving this particular task, you build in accuracy, very good power, and safety into the system. And as a consequence of that, you can have robots which can very closely interact with humans. So here's an example of a robot that we have in our lab just across the street in Informatics Forum where it's robots trying to pour a cocktail um, <laughs> and the pesky humans trying to get in its way, but it's adapting all the time and while trying to, <laughs> to make sure that it's, it's still doing the right thing, right? So, so here's a way we can interact in an interesting, safe manner. <laughs> okay, so, so these were examples of robots and humans interacting, the elements that you need to make robots more intelligent, more autonomous. So now I want to show you an example of a shared autonomous behavior in action, something live, okay? So I'm going to introduce my daughter, Maitli Vijayakumar, who's going to actually um, help me do this little demonstration task. So this is a prosthetic hand. This is um, an artificial limb that is used for patients who have lost a limb, either through an accident or through sort of congenital de uh, defects. And the way it works is these are little EMG sensors. They sense the activity of my muscles on my brain. Oh, sorry, on my, on my hand. And once I wear them, you can see that she's turned it on. And I can, using my bio signals from my hand, manipulate this, this hand. So here's an example of directly interfacing human actions, human intentions to an artificial system to go on and, for example, if you want to try and grab this, this object and I can drop it. Okay. And the, the real fun part is I can do various shapes. For example, I can go and grab this ball. And even something more challenging, like uh, this rather pretty unwieldy object, right? So, so where is the shared autonomy here? So my intentions are coming from here, but I can almost look away from the hand and still 
the hand will decide for itself when to stop closing around an object. So I've devolved, I've given my intentions, but there are some smarts in the hand that figure out when it should stop sort of squeezing further. And that's why it can adapt to different shapes. So here's a very good example of devolving control while taking human in the loop and the intentions um, in practice. Thank you very much. So, so, so you saw a real example of human in the loop shared autonomy. And this should not be so surprising to all of you. In our human body, we do that all the time. There's a significant level of autonomic functions that we actually implement. For example, the breathing, your heart, your digestive systems, you don't, you've devolved control over these systems and you've trusted your system to take care of it while dealing with more fun stuff like, you know, playing a game of football, actually cricket, um, <laughs> or, or even, um, you know, um, taking a walk in the park. So really, the concept of shared autonomy exists in human systems. Now the question is, the really the million dollar question is, the robots are actually ready to share control with you. Are you ready to let go? Thank you very much.